Well, what I want to do really is kind of give you uh, a rough um, overview of what book sprints are, some of the ideas, and how it's not a, most importantly, really a binary between book sprints and real books. And that actually something interesting is happening more generally in terms of book writing, publications, and publishing more generally. And I think book sprints, in a certain sense, are a kind of symptomology or a diagnostic for thinking about some of those changes. Um, it's certainly um, really at the kind of uh, crux of some of the ways in which producing books is um, starting to be rolled out across the publishing industry. And I think those will feed back eventually, maybe in 300 years, I don't know, into <laughs> academic practice. It does take a while. So uh, what are book sprints? So book sprints are um, a kind of intensive process of writing collaboratively. Uh, and that's a very important part of what a book sprint is. A book sprint isn't uh, over six months or over a year or what have you. It is meant to deliberately be over a very short period. I think it's kind of a maximum of sort of eight days, uh, but it's certainly a very foreshortened and intensive period of time. For most academics, this is kind of the horror of, <laughs> of book sprints, it has to be said. The other thing about them that's very important is that they're located in a space, i.e. a real space, they're not virtual, and they require proximity. So everybody has to be in that space. And really, you know, if you think about it as a, a kind of framework for writing or a set of procedures and rules to enable us to write together, that's essentially why proximity is so important. You can't nip off um, down the supermarket or whatever, you can't you know, switch out into another world uh, and therefore you can't really use Skype or anything like that. You have to be there in the place. And I suppose that also feeds into the importance of truly collaborative writing. The, the important thing about this kind of writing process is it's not about individual authorship. The idea is to create a, a real uh, alloy, if you like, of different contributions. And again, that I think is very difficult. I mean, certainly with my first experience with book sprints, that was kind of a difficult thing to um, be part of, you know, letting go of those wonderful words you've written to be destroyed by your <laughs> collaborators. Uh, anyway, so generally speaking, they're divided into two kinds. This is a very kind of analytical um, uh, separation, bifurcation, but it really just helps you think about the different kinds of writings that uh, usually take place under book sprints. So there's what we might call extractive sprints, which are essentially about uh, acquiring tacit knowledge or documenting or uh, producing a kind of political intervention in some form. These tend to be more kind of blogish in the writing style, less perhaps academic as we normally think of it, um, and therefore can be very quickly produced and can contribute straight away to a, um, some sort of debate or document a process or document a software. And this is kind of showing you the, uh, the genealogy, if you like, of the sprinting method, which does come out of uh, a problematic in software, which was that nobody ever wanted to write software manuals. Mm -hmm. right? And so this was a way of bringing people together and forcing them to write, in a certain sense, under an intensive period. And um, what was interesting about the process was, in doing this, um, the developers, Adam Hyde and a bunch of other people who developed this process, actually uh, kind of hit on a very nice method for writing uh, uh, in, in different styles. So the other type is what we might call generative sprints. Um, uh, these are much closer to what we think of as academic writing. Uh, they tend to be much more uh, conceptual and creative in form. Uh, and they have a slightly different structure in terms of much more focus on uh, you know, creating concepts, developing concepts, bringing in theory and so on and so forth. So it's much more academic as well. And I think this is kind of reflected in the different kinds of word counts that are generated by the two forms. So 45,000 words is a not uncommon number for these kind of extractive sprints. And you can understand that because of the amount of fact <coughs> information that's generated just by bringing people into one room that needs to be organised essentially and the smaller number from the generative sprints. So um, <coughs> book sprints I think are really really great for, I mean it's one way of thinking through them I suppose, prototyping thoughts, working through ideas very very quickly, it's very rapid turnover and you could think of examples of this being for example putting together a, a research bid, certainly for drafting a research bid with collaborative um, a, a collaboration or a, a research group of about seven people or what have you, uh, as I said previously documenting a project or some kind of empirical work such as a white paper where you want to intervene into a debate rather quickly. 
Um, they're very good for political interventions, political pieces, um, just because of the, the, the processes, I think, contribute well to those kinds of styles of writing. Perhaps the difficulty here really is getting a single voice, uh, depending on the contributors you bring together in one place. Uh, but obviously, selection of contributors is part of, well, a very important part of the process. If you bring together people that can't work together, clearly it's not going to function. Um, but certainly the books I've been involved in have, have worked very, very well. Uh, and so, um, lastly, I think if you are thinking in terms of kick-starting academic writing, um, you do need to be very careful about contributors. I mean, it's the same as the careful selection of a, a collaborators on a, a research grant. You know, you want to make sure you can work with those people. Um, and so these things have to be sort of borne in mind, I think. These are the three book sprints uh, that I worked on. And as you can see from the word counts that I've put in there, they're sort of slightly different in emphases. Um, the first one was very much meant to intervene in a debate that was going on in terms of uh, digital aesthetics, um, um, theories around the digital and technology, and so on and so forth. That was in 2012. And that had quite a lot of people. I should have put the number of people. I think it was about 10 people involved. And that was my first experience of the book sprint, to which I was uh, very sceptical um, going into this process. And coming out of it, I was pretty amazed that we were able to produce not only so many words, but such an interesting discussion. That was remarkable for having such a variety of different writers. Um, so there were uh, people like myself, there were a couple of academics, there were curators, gallery curators, there were artists, um, there were um, people uh, involved in setting up shows, and, and, and journalists, of course, as well. So there's a real variety of people. And of course, trying to um, corral that into a single voice was a very interesting process to watch as it unfolded, and that's what really brought to the fore the kind of processes that are, that are used. The second was a much more academic text, this was produced for the uh, Transmediala Festival in 2013, although we wrote it in 2012. Uh, and this was um, four people, so it's a much smaller number, and um, much more intensive in terms of um, rigorousness and attention to a kind of theoretical unfolding of some of the questions. And you can see there's a kind of um, refrain where this was a much more... Um, careful reflection on this notion of the new aesthetic as it was in 2012, but also how this related to um, issues of um, museums and archives <coughs> and so on and so forth. And then lastly, in 2013, as a result of those two experiences, the Book Sprints organisation um, wanted us to um, theorise the Book Sprint, and being um, the people they are, they wanted to Book Sprint the Book Sprint. <laughs> right? The Sprint on Sprints, as we called it. And this had one, two, three, four, five, six, six people involved. And that was probably the toughest book sprint because I think that was the first time that um, the book sprint people themselves had been involved in a book sprint, which put them in a very, a really contradictory position because what makes a great facilitator in a book sprint, because there's always a facilitator, is they don't get involved in the writing and here they were breaking all their own rules and that was a very interesting book to produce and it, and it does have this kind of schizophrenic uh, tendency to move between what you might call the generative and the extractive um, and therefore I think it's got quite a there's quite an amusing tone to it uh, if you take a look at it and I think you'll see that in the way it's produced so Helen they last as I say they're time box they're short periods usually about three to five days although there have been longer book sprints the 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 thing about them is they are truly exhausting, right? truly exhausting. Um, they start at 9am sharp uh, and they finish maybe 11pm, depending on the work regime. They're very, very intensive periods of writing. Um, food comes to you is an important part of the process. You're not allowed to escape from the book sprint once you've uh, started uh, and it's very important that you know it's good food and this is all laid on and prepared and you can just wander over and get stuff um, and therefore you know if you do a 10 day sprint you know you're going to be near death by the end of it I think um, the aim is essentially to produce there is an, an object at the end of it which is this publication um, and the publication is meant to be post draft post proof as well uh, which is um, then able to be sent off and produced and we'll come to that at the end how that functions because I think that's an interesting part of the book sprint process um, 
there is a uh, specialized software that's used in the book sprints and this is a kind of ongoing uh, software development the book sprint people themselves are now writing some specialized software and this software is really interesting um, because it's written based on many experiences of book sprints and so it's kind of uh, counterintuitive in the way in which it works. It's certainly not how you would have previously worked with text, um, but essentially it promotes a kind of private space for writing, which is then made public. Right? So it's this constant moving into a private writing space and then making public that writing. And once that writing is made public, it's fair game for anyone. That's an important part of the process. Buying into the process is accepting that. Um, and letting go of one's own text. Um, so BookType was the software I mostly used. Um, I forget the name of the second uh, generation. But um, it's um, kind of crude um, compared to the kind of wealth of features and functions that we procrastinate using with Word. So it doesn't do very much. Um, but it does handle the collaboration very, very well. And it does allow you to structure the book very, very quickly. And um, there is a huge consideration on space itself, or perhaps place is a better term. And the idea really is, is that there are two uh, kinds of space. There's a shared writing talking area around a table, um, which note the very interesting connection between writing and talking. Where one writes, one talks. Which is very interesting because when we started off on my first sprint, some of the people got very annoyed with that I'm a bit of a chatterer. When I'm sitting at a table, they got very annoyed with talking at the table. And the facilitator was like, no, this is for writing and talking. And that's actually a very interesting part of the process because it allows people to vocalise concepts and ideas and work through in a very social uh, uh, um, engagement type uh, process. But there is also kind of quiet working spaces where people can leave the group and they go off and, and do whatever they want to do, maybe read a paper or whatever, whatever. Um, so the process requires this kind of buy-in. Again, there's a very interesting process. Uh, it's often talked about in quite a computational way. So a book sprint boots, and in the booting of the process, um, there are the kind of rules and regulations are kind of unfolded, right? And it's very interesting because um, in the second book sprint I went to, the uh, facilitator forgot to boot the process. Right? And one of the most basic things is you introduce yourselves as part of the process and introducing I mean you know I'm very British I won't talk to people unless I'm introduced to them right it's an important part of the process of being in the social engagement for me so by not introducing us it was quite interesting really clogged up the process for a couple of days until he realized he'd forgotten to introduce us and had to reboot uh, the sprint halfway through so it's kind of interesting um, so that's a really important part of the process and that really is about what the rules are what shouldn't shouldn't be done and how it kind of functions um, the facilitator, I say, there's always a facilitator, and um, the most important part about that is they don't write. They're just there as referees, really, and to help people who might have writer's block or what have you. And I saw that actually actuated in, in, in all the sprints I've been involved in. It's quite interesting to watch that happening. Um, they, <laughs> most importantly, perhaps, they protect the process. The process is absolutely sacrosanct. It's not, you don't. Um, and again, I think this is difficult maybe for those of an academic bent. You're not meant to critique the process as you're doing the process. You're here to use the process. Um, that was uh, uh, you know, part, part of me buying into it, essentially, was to stop, keep asking questions about why it is we do things in certain orders or whatever. Um, but nonetheless, conflict is an important part of the process. It is a, a productive part of the process, and the facilitator has to balance that. Okay, so just going to show you some photos. So these see, these are what the writing spaces themselves look like. They're, no surprise, they're tables. Um, and people look very engaged in the process on the left there. Um, and you can see food is at the back here, so you don't need to leave the room. The Transmediala one was quite hilarious, because uh, we did it in the Transmediala offices in Berlin. And um, every five minutes, someone would pop their head in and say, how's it going? So they're so excited <laughs> that there, there could be a book sprint. And so essentially, the facilitator had to go and tell them all to please stop interrupting us every five minutes. But anyway, that writing table is where you talk and work. And then you go off from that uh, process. And as I've said, that has to be very carefully enforced. And it is a really important uh, part of the writing process. And it has actually changed the way I write. Um, because I've stopped thinking about writing as being surrounded by silence, as it were. You, need, you do need sociality, I think. These are the main parts that you run through. Um, you 
Uh, after you've booted, you go through a kind of concept mapping process, which is lots of fun. Everything's open for discussion in terms of concepts, themes and ideas, title, and so on and so forth, which essentially creates ownership, I think, of the process straight away and allows people to all make a contribution. Then those concepts are structured. Uh, this happens very quickly. I mean, you can almost see this as day one, day two, day three, day four, day five. I mean, they can happen as fast as that, although concept mapping and structuring can also be just done on one day. Then there's the writing bit, maybe the hard bit, which is people have to be encouraged to go off and write whatever it is they need to do. If they can't do that bit, they're swapped off very quickly to another bit so you don't get writer's block and all those kind of problems. And lastly, there's a kind of compositional or editing process where you kind of going through the copy editing and proofing. Some of these run in parallel as well, so you shouldn't think of these necessarily as a temporal. Here's some more photos. That's what concept mapping looks like, putting loads of post-it notes on the board. Um, when I have tried to do these things with academics, I found them totally sceptical about this process, as if it's the most ridiculous thing in the world, <laughs> which I found kind of interesting. But actually, as part of the process, it is very, very smart and very, very interesting. Uh, then these concepts themselves, it's not a very good photo, unfortunately, I did it on Instagram, so I was trying to make it look like interesting, like three years ago. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that obviously didn't work because now you can't read anything. But nonetheless, um, you can see they're slowly being moved around and organised and arrows are being made. And the, you can see the structure of the book apart, uh, uh, starting to appear, which I think is quite interesting. This is the software bookie, as you can see, it looks like it was designed in 1995. It's very basic, but what it does do is everyone can see the same thing. Those are the chapters or sections, and they have locks on them when people are writing to enable that kind of semi-privacy when you're working. There's writing again. Looks very exciting. That was at the V2 Gallery in uh, Rotterdam. Um, this is the last stage, pretty much before publication. And this is kind of the exciting part, which is the, if you like, the materialization of the book sprint. Everything's printed out put down the flat space and you see the book and there's a real spatial feeling at that moment and you can see which chapters over here at an earlier stage of it you can see the chapters which are completely out of control <laughs> and those ones no one wanted to write <laughs> right? and that's that's really interesting because you have to make real decisions then about well maybe we should just drop that chapter or what have you and you expect to have more of a kind of sort of gentle curve of the structure of the book or maybe a more even distribution um, so um, then the final stage is pressing a button uh, and it's really wonderful the way all this is built into the software. The whole of the software is kind of built around HTML5. For those who know anything about HTML5, it's kind of radical uh, rethinking about the how one understands the foundational condition of possibility for publication for stop. Um, and by that I mean that it's not XML. <laughs> really, and anyone who knows those debates will perhaps find that kind of interesting. Um, also, you might note that uh, EPUB 3 is now essentially HTML, which is kind of also very interesting in terms of where publication structures and formats are going. So you choose what you want to publish to and how you want to publish it, and then it just generates it on the fly from the HTML5 in whichever format you want, PDF, eBook, uh, Mobi, um, it also sends it directly to Lulu, anybody who knows Lulu, a print-on-demand service, so you could order a hardback copy or paperback copy immediately. It's incredible. And it's pretty strange, actually, when you publish it and it's just instantly available. I mean, that's a very odd uh, part of the process. Um, okay, so that was just a very brief intro. I hope that was uh, giving you most of the information. I do want to emphasize that kind of loose but taught structure. I think there's an interesting tension there in the way in which it functions and I think that really helps the kind of creativity of the process. Um, ba -ba -ba -bum. I'll just note that when I last was involved, which is two years ago now, there were over 80 successful book sprints, which means essentially 81, doesn't it? But now they've done tons more since then. And they're also experimenting with loads of other kinds of um, book sprint ideas. Uh, I've been involved in a data sprint, which is very interesting, where people essentially um, threw loads of data on the table, some libraries, for example, just threw like... Um, a data set on the table and we could sprint based on the data which is a very interesting process but there have been um, poetry sprints and novel sprints and um, uh, one of the things we were thinking about running in MFM was an opera sprint uh, which would be quite uh, an interesting thing to do. Um, so really this is and this is the kind of thing that I find interesting about it kind of more generally is that it starts to make you think about books in a different way because books themselves are websites and 
books on paper are not very good websites. That's the weird thing about how this process makes you change your understanding of books. And that really has, I think, kind of interesting implications and is already changing the publishing industry and the way in which they're working. Okay, so that's, that's it. Um, this is the book. If you want to go and find it on the internet, it's widely available as a PDF or an e-book. And uh, it's well worth taking a short look at. Thank you.